What's going on guys? Jason here from The Comprehensive Dentist. Uh, you're probably wondering what that intro was all about. I'm going to tell you shortly on that one. Today I want to talk about some treatment planning considerations. I want to go over some things that I think is critical to the, the dentist who is trying to treat their patients comprehensively. But I also want to talk about overtreatment, okay, and some of the ways that you can minimize overtreatment of your patients. All right, so I went shooting with my buddy Russ the other day, and that's what the, the intro you saw was all about. And while we were out there shooting, it got me thinking about a lot of things. You know, when you're doing target practice, you know, I grew up in Kentucky, so shooting a gun for me was like something I learned at a very young age. But while we were out there shooting, you know, there's a concept of accuracy and there's a concept of precision. Now, when we're talking about accuracy, when you're trying to hit a bullseye, you're talking about how close you can actually get the bullets to the bullseye, right? Obviously, if you're highly accurate, you're gonna be hitting the bullseye very frequently. Now, when you're talking about precision, it's about your groupings, right? So if you shoot 10 times and all your 10 shots are very tight little group, that's very precise shooting. And so I was thinking about this concept of accuracy and precision, and we're talking about how to get more perfect shot groupings and more perfect accuracy. And so it got me thinking a little bit about dentistry too, because there's a lot of times in dentistry we get this idea that we have to have a perfect occlusion. We have to have the perfect number of teeth. We have to have the teeth look a perfect way. We have to have aesthetics to look a perfect way. And so, you know, I had an instructor, he was an ortho mentor. His name was Dr. Weaver. And he said something when I was in training that really stuck with me, really indefinitely. He said that perfection is a direction it's not necessarily a destination. And so what does that mean? That means that, you know, in dentistry, we can have this perfect plan, we can have this perfect idea of what the mouth should look like. And in the end, like, even though we're aiming for that, even though that's like the direction that we're shooting for, we may not get there, right? So it may not be the destination that we end up at. I wanna talk about some things that you can do to minimize this concept of perfection and not over treatment plan your patients. All right, so first thing I wanna talk about is the concept of a missing tooth. Classic tooth that is oftentimes missing is the mandibular first molar, or any first molar for that matter. You know, a lot of times I get referrals for patients who want a consultation for an implant. And I ask them, okay, why are you here today? The patient says, well, I was told I need an implant or I, I need an implant, right? Do you really need an implant? Are you suffering from titanium deficiency so bad that you need an implant? And so I don't obviously say that to the patient, but I'm thinking those things. And so one of the things that I wanna implore you to do is to really look at the patient as a whole, ask some questions like, how's your bite? How are you chewing? Are you able to eat your food okay? Um, does the tooth that is missing bother you? Is it in the aesthetic zone? Does it matter if you can see this or not? You know, if the patient says, you know, it doesn't really bother me that I'm missing this tooth, it really doesn't impact my smile at all, then I'm gonna look at other things too. I'm gonna look at the occlusion. Is the occlusion stable? If it is, and the answer to all those things kind of doesn't suggest a need for the implant, I'm not gonna recommend a replacement for that tooth. Remember, there's always the option to do nothing. No treatment is a treatment option. And so I think many times we oversell this idea of needing to replace a missing tooth. And in those situations, you know, it's, all, it's not always necessary, right? So look at each patient individually, ask important questions, and then decide if a tooth replacement is necessary. All right, second tip I wanna talk about is in line with missing teeth, and it's the concept of a shortened dental arch. Okay, what is a shortened dental arch? Well, normally we have 28 teeth in the mouth minus the third molars. Now, if you lose any of those 28 teeth, specifically if you lose a second molar, or see you lose a second and a first molar, you now have what's called a shortened dental arch. And so, I'll be honest with you, I typically try to ensure that all my patients have at least first molar occlusion on both sides bilaterally. 
that's really a goal of mine. If they're missing both molars on one side, I try to at least make a plan to replace one of those molars to give them more efficient chewing. And, you know, obviously it creates a more stable occlusion in my mind. And so I will usually try to accomplish that. The idea of having one molar on one side is not the end of the world. It's going to be okay. They can still eat. They can still function. There's actually a lot of literature out there that suggests if you have two premolars bilaterally, or at least unilaterally, that you can still chew efficiently. It's not going to be disruptive to your bite. It's not going to be disruptive to your occlusion. That is a stable option. So I'd shoot for first molar occlusion, but a shortened dental arch is an option as well. All right, the third thing I want to talk about is uh, relates to diagnosing caries and the idea that, you know, when do you treat? And specifically, I'm talking about class two caries or inter interproximal caries or uh, caries that you see between the teeth. So in those situations, I see a lot of times that people choose to treat and other times providers choose not to treat. And so what's the actual criteria or the guidelines that you use for that decision? And so the, one of the things that I think that we should do is base it off of sound literature. So in 1992, there was what's called the Pitts article. And basically this doctor, he looked at radiographic images of bite wings. And he looked at where the caries went in the actual bite wing. So was it at the DEJ? Was it past the DEJ? And he basically, after that, he put orthodontic spacers between the teeth. And then he looked to see if there was an actual cavitation of the tooth structure. And what he found was that that typical board lesion you see in dental school, the one that goes to the DEJ, that even the ones that go slightly past the DEJ into the dentin, those were only cavitated 40% of the time. So 40% of the time there was a hole at the surface of the tooth. So in those situations you really don't need to jump right into treatment necessarily because the literature and the, the evidence suggests that you still have a 60% chance that there's not a cavitation at the surface at all. So that's something to consider as well. So when you're doing your, your, your exams and you're looking at these lesion, lesions, consider watching some of these lesions because the patient can always get a filling at some point in their life. But once it's done, you can't take that back. So I would make those decisions based off of sound evidence and it's okay to watch things, but my philosophy is also if you're going to watch a lesion, you're going to quote unquote watch a lesion, you should still treat it in the essence of doing fluoride varnish or silver diamond fluoride. But those are good options to help remineralize the tooth and arrest the lesion. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the, is the concept of when to do a crown on a tooth. Now, a lot of times, this is another thing where people disagree a lot on when you should crown a tooth and when you should not crown a tooth. The concept of capping cusps. And so he gives guidelines in that textbook of when you should consider covering a cusp to protect it from future fracture. And so a lot of times I use that as a guideline for when to do some type of cusp capping procedure. Now obviously a crown is a treatment option for capping cusps. But you know, if you see a tooth that has a large multi-surface uh, composite or amalgam, that doesn't necessarily mean it needs a crown. You know, many times these direct restorations are actually serving as cuspal coverage restorations, and they're protecting the tooth from future fracture because they are actually covering the cusp itself. So consider in some situations just leaving those alone, especially if the margins are intact, they're, they're, they're serviceable, they're not defective. Consider leaving those alone and just kind of monitoring the tooth. And if at some point that restoration fails, then you can consider an indirect restoration. But I think many of us don't use sound guidelines for making a decision to place a crown on the tooth. All right, guys, that's all I'm going to really talk about today. Um, hope you found these tips useful. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to consider when treatment planning your patients. These are just a few things that I consider and things I think that are important, especially for the restorative dentist. Uh, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you have not subscribed to the channel already, please do so and I'll see you next time.